We broke the time up, 15 minutes apiece. All right, what I'm going to do, I've got their names in this cup. And I'm going to draw them. And whoever, go, whoever uh, I draw goes first. Then I'm going to draw another. They'll be second. And the next one will be last. Amen? So once the, the other preacher is done, the other one you can start from your seat. Jump up preaching. Amen? You, you only got 15 minutes. You only got 15 minutes. And so once your time, once you get out of your pew, your time starts, all right? All right, let's see. First will be Brother Jeremy. Next is Brother Ed. And then will be Brother Tony Santabanez. Once Brother Jeremy's done... Brother Ed, just let her rip from the hip, so. All right. How do we know when our time's up? See that, that big hand on that clock right there is on the two? <laughs> Fifteen minutes from that point right there. Philippians chapter number four. Yeah. If you got your Bibles tonight, <clears throat> take the next few minutes, try to encourage each other in the Lord. It's a pleasure to privilege and a pleasure to be up here tonight behind this pulpit and uh, I hope that this will be a blessing and encouragement to you. Philippians chapter 4 verse number 4 the Bible says this Paul writing to the church at Philippi rejoice in the Lord always and again I say rejoice let your moderation be known to all men that the Lord is at hand <clears throat> be careful for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving let your requests be made known Unto God, verse number seven, and the peace of God that passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through our Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says there in the peace of God. Now there's a difference. Don't get this confused with the peace at peace with God. We, we, we become at peace with God the moment we get saved. Uh, the peace of God enters our life. We're not and no longer enemies with God or at enmity, the Bible says, with God. We're at peace with him. Then we, uh, we have this, uh, uh, in this abundant life theme that Brother Jesse was preaching about this morning. Uh, this uh, peace that passes all understanding comes after that point of salvation. It comes at times in life when we need it and at times in life when we don't think we can make it without God. Right. We're on the same page, that peace that passes all understanding. Can I get a show of hands tonight? Has anyone ever been through something in life that you don't know that you would have made it through it without the peace of God in your life and helping you through it? And that's what I'm talking about tonight, that peace uh, uh, of God which passes all understanding. It shall keep your heart in your mind. I want you to keep that thought in your head and I want you to know that there's three key things we can do to obtain this peace of God whenever we're going through certain situations in life and we really need God to help us. I don't know what anyone's going through tonight. I don't know your problems. I don't know what you're facing. I don't know what you're going to have to go home to tonight or what you're going to wake up to in the morning. But I serve a God and you serve a God that does. Yeah. And he still has the power, he still has the authority, and he's still able to help us through those problems and those situations. And one of the ways he does it is gives us peace in the middle of the storm. It said in verse number four, rejoice in the Lord always. And I like that the Apostle Paul saw fit right here to repeat that again. He said again, I say rejoice. You know, sometimes I think we get to that place in life where we feel like we are the exception to the rule. I see that a lot. You know, well, this, this, this rule is for everybody else, but I'm the exception. Right, right. Come on now. You know what I mean? Like uh, you get these kids running around here saying caffeine don't make me hyper. It makes me sleepy. I'm the exception. No, you're a liar. You get, you get the, everyone feels like they need to be the exception to the rule. Or uh, we have this rule that everyone has to follow, but me. They always want to be the exception. I know, I know, Brother Jeremy, we're supposed to rejoice in everything. And Paul said there, and again, I say rejoice. I know we're supposed to rejoice no matter what, but this time, 
Or, hey, you just don't understand what I'm going through. You just don't get what's going on here. You just can't do that. You just can't make it like that. It's too hard. The Bible says here that we should rejoice in the Lord always. No exception. No exception to that. Well, what if I'm going through this? What if I've had a death in the family? Or what if my dog got ran over and, and I'm all upset and I'm, and I'm torn about that? How can I rejoice about my dog being ran over? Or how can I be rejoiced about my parents getting divorced? Or how can I be rejoiced about that person that lied about me at work? Or that person that won't talk to me anymore that used to be friends? How can I rejoice in that situation? You don't have to rejoice for the situation. You have to rejoice in yeah the situation. You don't, you can't rejoice when, when something bad's going on. You can't say, God, I thank you so much for letting my dog get ran over. I hope nobody's dog got ran over and you're having a hard time dealing with that. I'm sorry. I just, I just popped in my head. I don't want to offend you. I want to encourage you. What, you just don't understand how hard that is. How you don't, you don't thank God for that happening. You thank God for other things that he's done for you. I think rejoicing is a lost art in the Christian life sometimes. Sometimes I think we come to church and we want to be in the moly grubs and we want to act all down and out and sad and pitiful and, and, and try to get attention from that to and maybe make me feel accepted or maybe feel some, kind of, feel, feel some kind of emptiness in our hearts. But I want you to understand tonight that if we're not rejoicing as Christians, we will not get that peace that passes all understanding. Peace that passes all understanding comes when you're able to rejoice. Think about the man that wrote this, Paul. He, could, he, he wrote this. wonder if he was thinking, uh, Brother Jesse, about that night him and Silas spent in prison. Yeah. And instead at midnight, they prayed and sang praises. They were rejoicing. Right. And the gates of the prison opened. I wonder if he was thinking about that night he spent at shipwreck or those times he was beaten and left for dead. If he found something in those times, in those moments, that peace that would give him strength and help him to keep going on for God. Why didn't Paul quit? Because Paul understood the importance of rejoicing in the Lord no matter what was going on. He said rejoice. And again, I say rejoice. I don't know what kind of problems await you when you leave here tonight, but I want you to know it's time for you to rejoice. Yeah, the second key that I see here in these verses to help us obtain that peace of God is be careful <clears throat> for nothing. Verse 6. Be careful for nothing. That means, Brother Ed, that it's okay for kids to have four-wheelers and trampolines. Be careful. I drank Brother Jesse's water. I'm sorry. My throat's dry. Be careful for nothing. Don't be scared to serve the Lord. Just go for it. Yeah. Be careful for nothing. I believe it's teaching. Paul's teaching there. In, in all the dangerous situations he was in, he understood. Be careful for nothing. No matter what situation you're in, serve God. Yeah. No matter what you're facing, serve God. Amen. Stand before the men that have the power to take your life and say, I'm not careful to answer you, uh, Agrippa. He wasn't careful. He chose to preach the gospel to the people that could kill him. Right. Be careful for nothing. Yeah. He said, be careful for nothing. I, I heard a story of uh, someone that, that knew a family. I'd never met these people. I don't know who they are. Uh, but uh, another preacher told me that they, they, heard, they saw this happen. Um, a uh, family, a young couple, had surrendered their life to go to the mission field. And they had a little boy, about five years old. And this couple took a, a, a survey trip and went over to the, to the other country and they started to see where they would be serving and, how to, and where they would be living and all kind of things like that. And they came back and they got to talk and they said, you know what, we don't think that's a good place to raise our family. That's not safe. It's, it's not a safe place. There, something bad could happen to our kids if we try to raise them there. So they decided that they would be safer not going to the mission field and staying here so they could keep their family safe and educated and in church and, and, and teach them to serve God from uh, the states in safety. Wasn't a few months after this decision was made, they uh, went looking for their five-year-old boy. It was time to eat and they called him and he never answered. 
They said, come inside. He was outside playing. Come on, it's time to eat. He never came in, and they began to run around the yard looking for him. Their five-year-old son and the dad noticed that the little cross-faced door on the house was open, and he grabbed a flashlight and went crawling in there to find his five-year-old son had crawled up in there and ran into a snake. And his, his son died. And you say, well, thought you were going to stay here so he could be safe. They were too careful. I wonder how many times God's wanted us to do something for him and we backed out because we were trying to be careful. We thought that we would be safer or save face. How many times I've been standing at the gas pump and God nudged me to talk to someone about salvation that I did not know. And I did not because I didn't think I was, I was too careful. I believe that you're more safe in the will of God in a cannibalistic tribe in Africa than you are at home out of the will of God. I don't know who it is tonight that's struggling with doing what God's called you to do, but I want you to know, Paul said, be careful for nothing. Be careful for nothing. How careful are you tonight? Then look in verse 6. It says, But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. So be careful for nothing, but pray for everything. Prayer should not be our last resort as a Christian. Sometimes we we find ourselves going through stuff and we're like, man, all I can do now is pray. Y'all been there before? I've been there. I've done everything I can do. All I can do now is just pray. (laughs) <laughs> how backwards is that? I wonder how many things we wouldn't have to do if we just pray in the beginning. Right, yeah. I mean, we act sometimes like we're bothering God by asking him to help us with something. Yeah. We act sometimes like, well, I think I can handle this on my own like it's an insult to get God to help us. Right. Don't let pride get in the middle of our, our relationship with God. God is there to help us. Yeah. God wants to help us. He wants to answer our prayers. He wants to meet our needs, and he wants us to pray in everything. Paul said, I've learned in everything we need to pray. We need to be thanksgiving. We need to have supp- make supplications. We need to make our requests known unto God in everything. And then we get right here. I haven't been watching the clock, so if I'm fired, just tell me when I'm done, okay? And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. I want you to know, not only if we do those three things, no matter what we go through in life, there'll be a peace in our lives that will change uh, how we are while we're going through that problem. Let me see if I can explain what I'm talking about. I've, I've gone through some, some things in life that personally uh, were tough, and I'm sure you have as well. There was a man uh, that, that wrote the song, It Is Well With My Soul. <clears throat> His name was Horatio. Is that right? Yeah. Sp- Spafford? He was a businessman, and he had sent his, his wife and his four daughters over to, uh, from Europe to, to America, to, to, and he stayed behind on some, running some business, and then he was going to meet them later. And he got a wire once she landed at, uh, set, hit the docks in America that there had been a shipwreck, and their four daughters had died. And he got on the boat as quickly as he could, and he sailed from, from Europe to America. And he got to the place. He had the captain tell him when they got close to the place where that shipwreck happened, where that accident was. And he said it was looking down at, in the ocean at, at the watery grave of his four daughters. And he took out a pen, and he wrote down, It is well with my soul. How? How can someone who has lost four children at the same time make this statement it is well with my soul how there's no other answer but God God is there for each and every one of us God wants to help every single person God wants to show you in your life how awesome 
He is. And if you're sitting here tonight and you don't think God's awesome, all I want to say is it's not God's fault. Amen, Amen Brother Jesse. I know what to do. I've done this plenty. Amen. Philippians uh, 2. Philippians 2. I've been in studying Philippians for about six months. It's a wonderful book. The verses, Brother Jeremy, made me nervous just then. We went to Philippians 4. Uh, he almost got on a verse. I'm going to spend some time on but he didn't. And... Uh, if there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies fulfill ye my joy, that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind, let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. I could answer your question, but Jeremy, how can you thank the Lord for a dog dying? Just You ain't got to feed him no more. So you save money, amen? I mean, that's one thing about it. Don't shake your head, Megan. You, you, you don't, it's just the way it is. Now, um, I, I told you, I've been studying Philippians for about six months. We've been going through it in Sunday school. It's a phenomenal book. I've always liked it, but I didn't know a lot about it till I really studied the background of when it was written. Uh, he was in prison, of course. It was written, uh, he met, he started the church at Philippi on the third, on the third missionary journey. Uh, it was started because of three conversions uh, in Acts 16. Uh, God, you remember, was sending him to Asia Minor where he wanted to go, where there was, there was hundreds of thousands of people. And God told him in a vision, the Holy Ghost said, you're not going there. You're going somewhere else. Of course, at the same time, there was a lady, Lydia, remember, that was there, and she was praying for God. And the Bible answered her prayer and sent the Apostle Paul. And she got saved, and the jailer got saved, and the book of Philippians was written. I believe it's his favorite book of the Apostle Paul. I mean, I've studied it really in detail the last six months a lot. I've used a couple of commentaries that's really helped me a lot and uh, if you notice in Philippians he doesn't rebuke anybody he doesn't reprimand them for nothing he doesn't have any doctrinal corrections or changes uh, it's just good practical Christianity and some very encouraging stuff because he and this church had a very close relationship the Bible says that they gave to him again and again so they supported Apostle Paul's ministry and he was real close to him now what I want to preach on a few I got about 13 minutes left so what I want to preach on a few minutes is what I taught in Sunday school and what I taught in Sunday school uh this morning, you know, I wish some of y'all that didn't come, I wish you would come to Sunday school, whether you're in Brother Jesse's class or our class or whatever, you know. Uh, we try to put a lot of time into it and effort. D.L. Moody said uh, the most important service of a church is Sunday school. Uh, D.L. Moody built his entire ministry on Sunday school. Uh, didn't even have a church service till three years after he started doing Sunday schools on Saturday afternoons, matter of fact. But anyway, Sunday school is important. So, you know, come to that. We, we prepare lessons. But here's, here's the sermon. We live in a day, uh, church, that it, it, this culture is selfish, um, uh, very selfish, um, very um, selfish. Uh, there, there's, we've never had a generation this selfish. We've never had a society this selfish. My dad's generation was not this selfish, I don't believe. Uh, my generation was and started it, and we've picked it up from there. And when I say society, that means all generations. That doesn't mean 
20-year-olds or 70-year-olds. That means everybody makes up our society. But we are a selfish society. Uh, we're taught that your rights is everywhere. And, and I'm not getting into the political part of civil rights and this right and that right or whatever. But we're so worried about everybody's rights. And we're so worried about being political correct that we've taken the, we've, we've put cover on the sin. We've put cover on things we shouldn't be covering. And we've not gave the truth like we should. And we're raising a generation, Brother Jesse said, that was a great, I mean a great message this morning, a great message to me this morning when he talked about children and I, I mean, I mean, I, I just did it with a deputy coroner. I told you, and, and he told me six suicides in Barrow County that they've dealt with personally, and almost every one of them, almost every one of them, the the child involved had a major problem with internet and video games and 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 movies and this or that or whatever, and, and it was putting things in their minds that. That, that just wasn't good for them and wasn't wholesome at all. Well, we live in a society that tells you, tells our children, tells us, everybody, you look out for yourself. Right. You're number one. If you don't toot your horn, nobody won't toot your horn. Right. If you don't look out for you, nobody will. And, and, and what, what we're taught basically is, what we're taught is, is you achieve what you need to achieve no matter what it costs anybody else. Yeah. Uh, it don't really matter what the best thing for the team is doing. It don't really matter what the best team for the family's doing. Uh, I mean, I, people people take jobs and move to cities because of money. And they leave quality of life places. And they leave churches that they should be serving in and praising God and growing their children up in. And it's always for money, it seems like. So you got $10 an hour more. So you got $30,000 a year more. But what did your family get? What did you get? Is it a better quality of life? I mean, is, is, is it going to put you and your family in a position that you can do the best or whatever? Well, that's just our philosophy. And I think what we need to do in this day is to put others first. Uh, my papa, that I, I talk about so much, my, my grandsons and them probably get tired. Uh, papa this and papa that. And don't smile too big, Dylan. Uh, I mean, you're, you'd be giving yourself away. My papa this and my papa that. But it was Nathan. My papa was the most unselfish person I ever knew, Brother Mike. My papa always put me first or his wife first, or whoever he was helping first. He never was demanding, really. He was never one to nitpick. He was never one to say, I don't want to go there. I want to go here. I'm just telling you. I mean, it, it, food, he ate what grandma cooked. Or he went to the restaurant. We didn't go to restaurants much, remember that. But he went to where everybody wanted to go. It wasn't the case, I don't want this, I don't want that. That generation was like that. I mean, that generation fought in World War II and World War I. And that they, they got the freedoms and the rights and the liberties that we have. Yeah. I mean, I'll be honest with you, church. I'd be scared that our society now had to fight for those things. I'd be scared right now that, that, that what we have now would stand up for what they stood up for. But it wasn't about them. And see, Jesus wasn't about him. He was never about him. It was always about somebody else. He was always humble with people. He was always loving to people. He was always forgiving to people. He, he never let race or he never let he had nationality or he never let uh, uh, social status or find it never mattered. He didn't care. He didn't care where you were from. He didn't care what color you were. He didn't care what your status in life was. He just wanted to help you. But we, I, I just, it's a challenge, church, and I've, I've got about six minutes here. It's a challenge, a challenge to, to get that away. Stop thinking of yourself. I mean, what, what do we hear all the time? Well, I, my feelings are hurt. I'm not being mean. But why does that matter so much? Yeah. Yeah. Say, oh, 
Why does that matter so much? So your feelings were hurt. Well, suck it up, buttercup. I know y'all hate to hear that today, but that's how I was raised. You, you think JT worried about my feelings? Trust me, y'all. My feelings were way down the list. It was what needs to be done or what I want you to do. And you just going to suck it up, son, and do it. But it put something in me. That, that, that The bus route we're doing right now. You say, why are you doing the bus ministry? Because this man asked me to. Because this pastor said to me, that's one thing I want you to do. And that's why I'm doing it. I mean, I love it. I've got a burden for it. But I said to him, what do you want me to do? And I'm, I'm 66 years old, church. I mean, I'm not bragging, but I could do a lot of things, a lot of places. But I couldn't do nothing no more than what I did today, be honest with you, Brother Mike. There's no, there's no big preacher's meeting that touches what I was able to do today. There, there's no ball game that could touch what I was able to do today. When you pull up in a bus and little kids are excited to come out and get on it and, and they hug your neck and say, oh, I'm glad you're here and I'm excited. And they go upstairs and they get preached to and taught the word of God and they get saved. Man, you don't replace that. There ain't a ball game that good. There ain't a movie that good. There ain't a video game that good. There's nothing that, there's nothing in a can you pop or something you snort up your nose that touches that. Amen. Yes, sir. Let's just think of others. Let's try as a church to think of others. Uh, I was battling depression couple times. Of course, some of y'all don't believe in that, but I don't really care what you believe. I don't care at all, and I love you, but I don't, you know, I, I didn't need, and they used to preach against it, but that was till, yeah. But I called Brother Pasquini, and I said, uh, Pasquini, I said, I'm really going through a really, really hard time right now. Just, there's some things just bury me, and I can't sleep, and I can't. He said, well, go do something for somebody else. I said, what'd you say? He said, I tell you what, he said, get up right now, Brother Ed. Get up right now and go buy somebody else something if it ain't but $10 and take it to them and give it to them. He said, or go somewhere where a family needs something and take them some food. Or buy a pair of pants and shirt for a little kid somewhere that needs a pants and shirt. And then he said, you may laugh at me, but he said, then read Robinson Crusoe. I said, but anyway, I did. It worked. Yeah. It really did. See, we're so tied up with ourselves. The drama comes from ourselves. You didn't call me. You didn't speak to me. You didn't consider me. Uh, well, what we talking about? Me. Yeah. Me. 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 It's my day off. It's my hour. It's my car. It's my money. It's my time. Uh, 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 no, it's not. It belongs to Jesus. The Bible says he bought it. The Bible says he paid the price for it. It's not yours. My children aren't mine. They're not. They're given to me by God. My grandchildren aren't mine. They're given to me by God. They're not mine. This church was never mine. Did you ever hear me call this my church? I ain't been mean about preachers. I don't think they mean wrong. But I never said my church. My church. This ain't my church. This is Jesus' church. This is His church. It's about Him. So just, man, just try tomorrow. And I, I'm not going to brag at all on what I've done or not done, not going there. But I've been doing a lot of stuff the Lord's allowed me to the last few months. I've been doing stuff nobody knows here or there. I've been giving a lot of stuff and helping some people out. And, and it's just so rewarding. I mean, you just feel so clean. I mean, you feel when you're through doing it, you just say, man, you know. I made a difference in somebody's life. I mean, what I did meant something. You know, 
Uh, I look at that bus route real serious. I look at it as the last defensive line. Because I remember Austin Reeves, some of y'all do too. A little teenage boy came to our church, rode a bus, and got saved. And six weeks later, his daddy went crazy and shot and killed him and his mama. Where would he have been if we wouldn't have reached him? That's what matters. You know, last thing, I'm closing, got half a minute. Last thing that I'll say. I watch on Facebook all these bucket lists. Oh, if I want a million dollars, I'd go here, I'd go there. I want to do this, I want to do that. I can't wait to shoot elk in Walmart. You yeah, yeah, my bucket list is what I'm doing right now. My bucket list right now is riding that bus today. Amen. My bucket list is watching my family sing and play. And just, sir, where do I want to live at? Northeast Georgia. Where do I live at? Northeast Georgia. Why? Because I want to. And God's put me here. Just learn. Turn your Bible to Deuteronomy chapter 30, if you don't mind. We'll read from 11 to the end of the chapter. <clears throat> For this commandment which I command thee this day, it is not hidden from thee, neither is it far off. It is not in heaven that thou shouldest say, Who shall go up for us to heaven and bring it unto us, that we may hear it and do it. Neither is it beyond the sea that thou shouldest say, Who shall go over the sea for us and bring it unto us, that we may hear it and do it. But the word is very nigh unto thee in thy mouth and in thy heart that thou mayest do it. See, I have set before thee this day life and good and death and evil. And that I command thee this day to love the Lord thy God, to walk in his ways, and to keep his commandments, and his statutes, and his judgments, that thou mayest live and multiply, and the Lord thy God shall bless thee in the land whither thou goest to possess it. But if thine heart turn away, so that thou wilt not hear, but shalt be drawn away, and worship other gods, and serve them, I denounce unto you this day that ye shall surely perish, and that ye shall not prolong your days upon the land, whither thou passest over Jordan to go and possess it. I call heaven and earth to record this day against you that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that both thou and thy seed may live, that thou mayest love the Lord thy God and that thou mayest obey his voice and that thou mayest cleave unto him for he is thy life and the length of thy days that thou mayest dwell in the land which the Lord swear unto thy fathers to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob to give them. So, uh, think on these two things as I preach these next few minutes. Think on the Word of God and life and death. Starting in verse 11 through about 14, it talks about this commandment which I command thee this day. Deuteronomy is a whole book recapping from the Exodus, or Genesis through the Exodus. It's a, a whole recap because this is... Moses, as he's about to... I need to get close to this thing. I don't have the mic on. This is weird. Moses is recapping all that's gone on from the Exodus of, through Genesis to the Exodus. He's recapping it all. He's going over all the, the miracles, the miracle of coming out of Egypt, the miracle of coming through the Red Sea, the miracle of uh, the water, the miracle that the fact that their shoes and their clothes didn't wear out for all those 40 years, all those long years God took care of them. And it's not as though they were new to God, right? He wasn't. He didn't. He had not just claimed them as His people, because at this point in their lives, God had guided them through so many things. So, our church has been here for what twenty three years now. It's a twenty three year old church. We've been here a while. God has brought us through so many things, brother Ed. God provided this land. God provided all the building materials. God provided that parking lot out there. He provided all of it. We've seen him bring us through great times. We've seen him bring us through hard times. And all because we did what, Brother Ed? We followed his word. So we can't claim ignorance. We followed the blueprint, right? We've gone to the best of our ability, as, as Brother Ed led it, and now Brother Jesse is uh, our pastor. To the best of their abilities, they have followed God's, followed God's word. So 
those of us who have sat under Brother Ed and now Brother Jesse for so long, there's no excuse. We know God's word. We understand what it says. We know the blueprint for it. We know that we are to come here to sit under God's preaching, but we're also to go out and spread God's word. We're to go out and spread the gospel. We're to go out and spread hope and peace and joy. But more than that, we are to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. And while we're doing that, because we're doing that, we're setting before the world, before our community, life and death. Hope and good. That's what we're doing. But I want to I think about us as, as individuals, as a church, as a collective here. Those of us who have been here for so long, there's no excuse for how some of us, myself included, have stepped back from what we're supposed to do. Right? Brother Ed, we used to go out soul winning. We used to go out and preaching the gospel. We used to go out and do more than what we're doing now. That's not to say that we're not already doing a lot. But it's time to get back to it. You've already had life and death set before you. And for a long time, myself included, we followed that path for for the best to the best of our ability. We we would go out, we wouldn't miss service, we wouldn't be late to services as I was this morning. We used to be harder about these things. But now some of us are living as though we're still in that death before we knew God. It's just what? Brother, I think Brother Jesse mentioned it this morning. We chose life and we're good with the bare minimum. We chose life, but we stepped away from the abundant part. Brother Jesse, that was really good this morning talking about how we've become the doormat sometimes for the thief to come in. We allow things on our TVs that we wouldn't used to have done. We allow certain influences to come in our ears and our minds and our hearts. And sometimes, Brother Jesse mentioned it this morning, that doesn't have to necessarily come through the world. It's, sometimes it's through the preaching we listen to. Sometimes it's through the books that we read. But if we just get back to God's Word, yeah. we'll get back to yes. what started it all for us. The blueprints, the, God's Word, the, the, the thing that we put our faith in to begin with. That's what I'm laying before you again today. Some of us have followed it before and have stepped away. So, get back to it. I know that's very, really basic. There's not much to what I'm trying to say other than if you're still where you were, where you're uh, following it to the, everything you could, you're at every service, you're listening to the right music, the right preaching, the right people, the right friends, you're, you're still doing that, keep at it. If you've stepped away from it, I encourage you, I implore you, get right back into it. If there's a Wednesday service that you haven't been coming to, start coming to it. If Brother Jesse's going off to preach it maybe an hour or so away, and he, he, I realize oftentimes a lot of us are working, we can't go do these things, but we ought to be at every possible thing. If there's a prayer meeting, we ought to be at it. If there's soul winning, we ought to go. If there's somebody at work, not, it's not, it doesn't even, even necessarily have to be a church function, we are Christians not just in these walls or at yeah. church functions. We're church or we're Christians at work. We're Christians at school. We're Christians at the gas station. Spread the gospel. I've heard stories of, about how the teenagers used to go and they would have competitions to see who could hand out the most tracks. They'd have competitions at who could uh, win the most souls. And I haven't seen that in a long time and I need to get back to it myself. So I'm setting before you life and death I'm, and I need to start setting before the world and you need to start setting before the world life and death peace give them God's word they need it we're, we're coming out of a pandemic now that has ruined people's lives they're, they're so riddled with anxiety and depression they don't know what to do people like I said a few weeks ago are driving around in their cars by themselves with a mask on 
I'm for masks. If, if, if people want to wear masks and, and if they're more comfortable and if I come to their place and I'm working in their home, they want me to wear a mask, I'm more than comfortable doing that. But people have gotten so crazy about it. They're wearing masks in their cars by themselves. And all because what? They don't have something to hope in. Right? There's people that need hope. There's people that need God's word. There's people that need to be saved. We have it. So there's no excuse for it. We can take it to him. There's a, I'll, I'll give this example from later on in the Old Testament and I'm done. There's some lepers that, uh, they're lepers, they're outcasts. They don't have any place in Israel because they're not allowed. It's against the law. But there's an army, I forget which army it is, that has this great giant army in the whole of Israel. The king of Israel, he's worried, the people are worried. And the lepers are like, we're going to die anyway. May as well go see what we can do. And they go and they see that the, the camp, the army, they're gone. They're, there's nobody there. And they're just like, there's all this food. There's all this gold. There's all this raiment. There's all this blessing has come upon us seemingly at random. And then one of them says, hang on a minute. We are Israelites. And there's this great victory. And we're not telling people about it. What they say is, we do not well. We have this good news. And by withholding it from the world, we do not well. That's all I got, Brother Jesse. Amen. All right, open your Bibles. No, I'm kidding. (laughs) It's all right, Megan. Amen. Amen. She just about had a stroke. Amen. Amen. All right. If you, how many of y'all enjoyed that? We're just going to keep doing it that way. I like it. Amen. I enjoyed it. It was good. It was good. We've had a good day in the Lord's house. Amen. Let's do this. Let's do uh, J Dollars quickly. Let's do J Dollars as quick as we can. And then we'll dismiss to go downstairs and uh, enjoy our fellowship this evening and our food and uh, anybody that's staying, uh, you stay as long as you'd like. Uh, we'll be here for quite a while. We'll have a fire, and we got games and stuff, and food. And do we?